All right. So you've sent over all these articles about capacity processes for training design. Mm. And it seems like we're really trying to go beyond just like a check the box program. Yeah. Something that actually boosts performance, you know, out there in the real world. Absolutely. Um, so no fluffy stuff here, right? Yeah. Just straight to the point. Right to it. Tell me about these PASI-T processes. So they're all about giving people the tools that they need to excel on the job. Okay, so practical application. Absolutely. Not just theoretical knowledge. Yeah. And the author, Guy Wallace, he seems yeah. almost allergic to generic training. He is. He keeps saying performance-based, performance-based, perform performance Well, he's got a point. Yeah. Generic competency lists. Right. They just don't cut it. You need to start with a crystal clear picture of the performance that you want to see. Okay, so give me an example. Okay, so imagine you're training airline attendants. Okay. Instead of having this generic customer service module, you would look at the specific steps of, say, boarding passengers. Okay. What are the outputs? Okay. What are the tasks that they need to do? How do the master performers handle those common passenger situations? Interesting. Yeah. So like pinpointing those micro behaviors yes. that add up to excellence. Absolutely. It's like the difference between reading a cookbook mm -hmm. and then actually cooking a meal. Exactly. One is theory and one is like getting your hands dirty. 100%. And seeing if you can actually pull it off. And just like a chef needs a detailed recipe, effective training right. needs that same level of granularity when it comes to performance data. Now, within this performance-based framework, yeah. Wallace talks about three levels of pace CT processes. He does. What are they? So think about it like building a house. Okay, I'm intrigued. Walk me through this. Okay, so you start with the architectural plan. Mm -hmm. That's your curriculum architecture. Yeah. This is the high-level view of your training program. Okay. Then you've got the detailed blueprints for each room. Okay. That's your modular curriculum development, oh, right? Mm -hmm. You're outlining the specific learning objectives the content. Okay. And then you get down to your furniture and decor. Okay. That's the instructional activity development. That's where you actually design the activities. So we're moving from the big picture down to the smallest details. Exactly. Which honestly, it sounds a little overwhelming. Well, and, and it's designed to be more efficient and effective. Okay. So you tackle it systematically. You start high level and you work your way down. Okay. That's a relief. Yeah. Now, another thing that caught my eye was how much Wallace stresses the importance of teamwork Yes. in this process. Absolutely. Why can't one brilliant instructional systems designer just handle it all? Because to design effective training, you need different perspectives. Okay. You need master performers who can give you that real world insight. Mm -hmm. You need subject matter experts who have the deep knowledge. Mm -hmm. And you even need novices. Novices? Yes. Okay, I get the other two, but convince me why the novices are so important. Because they just learned this stuff. Okay. They remember the hurdles that they had to get over the information that was critical to their early success. Things that maybe seasoned pros just forget about. That's a really interesting point. Yeah. It's like getting feedback on a website. Yeah. Both from tech gurus yeah. and people who've never seen it before. 100%. Because they're going to tell you very different things. Yeah. And both of those things are important yeah. for different reasons. So we've got the performance-based design. We've yeah. got these three levels. We've got the team. Mm -hmm. What's next? Well, next we have to talk about testing. Okay. Wallace is a huge advocate for rigorous pilot testing. Okay. And it's not just an extra step. It's where you put the training through what he calls a full destructive test. Oh, that sounds intense. It is. So tell me more about this. What are we trying to accomplish here? Well, think of it like a dress rehearsal. Okay. Before opening night, you want to catch any snags or inconsistencies or anything that's just not quite working. So we're looking for feedback on everything, the content, the delivery, the uh, flow. Everything. Okay. And we want feedback from two crucial groups. Okay, who are they? Representatives from your target audience, so the people who are actually going to be taking the training. Mm -hmm. And representatives from management. Management? Why management? Because we want to make sure that it aligns okay. with the overall goals and standards of the organization. So it's about making sure that this training is relevant and applicable to the real world challenges exactly. that their teams are facing. It has to work on both levels yeah, for the employees and for the organization. So it's about finding that sweet spot yeah. where employee needs and organizational goals align. 100%. And we're getting feedback from both sides exactly, exactly to make sure that happens. The doers and the decision makers. And I like it. Yeah. Okay. So what 
specific kind of feedback are we hoping to get during this pilot test phase? Everything and anything. Yeah. Is the content clear and engaging? Are the activities challenging and relevant? Is the pacing appropriate? Are there any logistical hiccups that need to be ironed out? So we're essentially handing them a, a magnifying glass yes. and saying, go through this with a fine tooth comb. Tell us. Find those problems now. Everything. Good. And bad. The bad. Before it's too late. This is fascinating. Yeah. I'm really starting to see how this is so much more than just throwing together some PowerPoint slides. It's about creating a culture. Yeah. of continuous improvement, yeah. where training is seen as an investment. And it's strategic. Systematic. It is, and you're involving the right people right from the start. Yeah. You've got your master performers, your subject matter experts, even those novices. And so by doing that, we're making sure that this program is relevant, it's practical. It's adaptable. It can evolve Absolutely. as the organization changes. It should never be static. Okay, this is all making a lot of sense to me. I'm starting to see how we can use these PCT processes to really transform how we approach training and development. It's a different way of thinking about it. It is. It's moving away from that kind of reactive check the box mentality. And those generic competency models. Yeah. We're talking about being focused, data driven. And we're really focused on those real world results. You want to see that needle yeah. move? Yeah, I like it. Mm -hmm. All right. So we've designed this great program. We've got our content organized. Mm -hmm. We've made it accessible. We've made it adaptable. It's time for the rubber to hit the road. Exactly. Let's yeah. pilot test this thing and make sure it actually works. Yeah. It's not just about the design of the training itself. Okay. It's about how you organize and manage that content for the long haul. Okay, so like creating a knowledge ecosystem. Exactly. That supports continuous learning yes. and performance improvement. Yeah, because nobody wants to deal with disorganized training materials. Oh, it's the worst. It is. It's a nightmare to navigate, to update, to even figure out what's relevant anymore. It's a mess. So how do we avoid that mess? Well, one key concept is something called enterprise content architecture. Okay. Imagine like a well-organized library, but instead of books, it's all your training materials. So everything's categorized and stored based on its purpose. Yes. Target audience, even its level of detail. It's like the Dewey Decimal System. I love it. For all of your training content. That's fantastic because then you can avoid duplication. You can streamline updates and people can actually find what they need. Exactly when they need it. When they need it, which is essential. Time is money after all. Exactly. And that leads us to another important part of this, which is modular curriculum development. Okay. So instead of building these big long courses, right. we're going to break the training down into smaller reusable modules. So it's like we're creating these building blocks that yeah. we can then assemble in different ways, depending yeah. on who we're talking to. It keeps your training flexible and adaptable because you can design custom learning paths. OK, so let's say I'm working with a new sales representative. Okay, I might use modules on product knowledge, right? sales techniques, company policies. But if you're working with a seasoned manager, right? maybe we're talking about leadership development. OK. Strategic thinking change management. Pulling from the same library? Same library. Different modules. And that's efficient. Very efficient. And just effective. Because you can reuse those modules. Yeah. Update them. It all feeds back into that continuous improvement idea. It does. We talked about. Yeah. Because we're constantly refining these modules. You're not just delivering information. You're curating a dynamic knowledge base. So it's like having a living, breathing training program exactly. that adapts and grows. That's a key advantage. Along with the organization. Your training program becomes a valuable asset. Okay, this is all making a lot of sense. I'm definitely seeing the power of this approach. Good. But got to be honest, it sounds like a pretty big undertaking. It's an investment. Okay. But it's an investment that pays off. Right. Because at the end of the day, effective training is an investment. In your people. Yes. In the success of your organization. And when your people are equipped to succeed, the entire organization benefits. Increased productivity, reduced errors. Improved morale, a culture of learning. Those are some pretty good returns. They really are. And here's the thing. Yeah. The past CT processes. Yeah. They're not just for your traditional classroom training. You can use this for knowledge management mentoring programs, informal learning. So it's about creating a more holistic approach. A culture of learning. Yes. Where learning is embedded in the flow of work. It's everyone's responsibility. Yes. Okay, this has been eye-opening. I'm starting to see how these PASCT processes can really transform how we approach 
training and development. It is a fundamental shift. It is. It's moving us away from that reactive check the box mentality to something that's much more proactive. We're data driven now. Yes. We're focused on performance and measurable outcomes. And by taking the time to build that content library mm -hmm. and embrace that modular design. We can create training that's not just effective, but also efficient. Yes. And adaptable. Work smarter, not harder. Exactly. All right. So we've designed this program. We've organized our content. Made it accessible, adaptable. What's next? Time to put it to the test. The moment of truth. Let's talk about pilot testing. Yeah. And making sure that this thing actually works. Okay, so we've designed this amazing performance-based training program. Mm -hmm. We've talked about organizing our content like a well-oiled library, ensuring it's accessible and adaptable. Yes. Now it's time for the big test, right? Right. Time to see how these pieces come together in the real world. Exactly. And as we touched on earlier, pilot testing isn't just a formality. It's your chance to put your training program through its paces to identify any areas for improvement before you roll it out to the entire organization. You used an interesting phrase earlier, something about a, a full destructive test. What did you mean by that? And what are we looking to achieve in this phase? It's about being proactive, not reactive. We want to uncover any hidden issues, any blind spots in our design before they become major problems. Feel a bit like a dress rehearsal for a big opening night. Yeah. It's your chance to catch those lighting cues that were missed, to smooth out any awkward transitions, to ensure that the entire performance is polished and engaging from curtain rise to final bow. So we're looking for feedback on absolutely everything, the content itself, the way it's delivered, even the logistical flow of the program. No detail is too small to scrutinize. Precisely. And remember those two crucial groups we talked about earlier. We need feedback from both representatives of our target audience, the people who will actually be participating in the training, and a select group of management representatives. Okay, I'm still a little hung up on the management piece. Help me understand that perspective again. Why is their input so crucial during this pilot test phase? It's about ensuring alignment and maximizing the impact of the training. Management representatives provide that vital quality control check. They're there to validate that the training content aligns with broader organizational goals and standards. They bring that big picture perspective to ensure the training is relevant and applicable to the real world challenges their teams are facing. So it's not about micromanaging the design process. It's about ensuring that the training truly adds value on multiple levels, meeting the needs of individual employees while also advancing the strategic objectives of the organization. Exactly. By gathering feedback from both sides, we get a much richer, more comprehensive understanding of what's working well and what needs to be tweaked, refined, or even completely reimagined. It's about ensuring the training delivers on its promise. That makes a lot of sense. So we've got our two groups of pilot testers ready to go, eager to share their insights. What specific questions should we be asking them? What kind of feedback are we hoping to elicit? We want to be as thorough as possible, so don't be afraid to dig deep. Ask them about the clarity and engagement level of the content. Are the materials presented in a way that's easy to understand and retain? Are the activities challenging enough to be engaging, but not so difficult that they become discouraging? Is the pacing of the program just right, or are there parts that feel rushed or unnecessarily slow? And let's not forget about the logistical aspects. Were there any technical glitches, scheduling conflicts, or other hurdles that need to be addressed? It's like we're handing them a metaphorical magnifying glass and asking them to examine every facet of the training program, from the overall learning objectives down to the smallest details of delivery and execution. You got it. We want their honest, unfiltered feedback, both the good and the bad. Remember, this is our chance to fine-tune the program before it goes prime time. Every piece of feedback, every observation, every suggestion is an opportunity to make the training even better, even more impactful. This entire PCT approach is really impressive. It's so much more than just throwing together a few PowerPoint slides and calling it training. It's strategic, it's systematic, and most importantly, it keeps the focus squarely on driving real-world results. That's what sets it apart. It's not just about checking a box or delivering information. It's about creating a culture of continuous improvement, where training is viewed as an investment, not an expense, and where everyone is empowered to contribute to their own development and the success of the organization. And by involving the right people, master performers, subject matter experts, novices, even management, we're ensuring that the training program is relevant, practical, and consistently evolving to meet the changing needs of the organization. Precisely. It's a collaborative effort, a continuous loop of feedback and improvement. And remember, the journey doesn't end with the pilot test. 
ongoing evaluation is crucial. We need to measure the impact of the training, gather feedback from participants and their managers, and constantly look for ways to refine and improve the program over time. So as we wrap up this deep dive into the PACT processes, what are some key takeaways our listeners should remember as they embark on their own training design journeys? First and foremost, remember that effective training starts with a deep understanding of the desired performance. What do you want people to be able to do differently as a result of this training? Once you have that clarity, the PACT processes provide a roadmap for designing and developing a program that delivers. Don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Involve the right people, those who have a stake in the success of the training. And remember that feedback is your friend. Embrace the pilot test phase as an opportunity to learn, to iterate, and to ensure your training program is truly hitting the mark. And never stop learning. The world of work is constantly evolving, so our approaches to training and development need to evolve as well. Stay curious, stay engaged, and never underestimate the power of a well-designed training program to transform individuals and organizations. This has been an incredible deep dive. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. I'm feeling energized and ready to ditch those generic training manuals and embrace a more performance-driven approach. It's been my pleasure. Remember, investing in your people is always a wise decision. Until next time, keep learning, keep growing, and keep diving deep. Mm -hmm.